background is in architecture and I study theology. I just graduated uh, this May and I work with the community organization on the south side of Chicago. We're really at Chicago Lawn and in the Inglewood area and we uh, work on fostering health, wellness, and healing in the inner city. So um, what I really have for you is not because I have done extensive work on economics, but because uh, through my background in architecture and theology, economics really happens to be a theme that's central and underlying a lot of human conduct and behavior. And uh, so deliberations on economics were really natural for us. And um, I, I am, of course, as you can see, I am Muslim. And I have, it's a very integral part of my religion, uh, conduct around economics is a very integral part of my religion. And um, yeah, so I would really like to share a lot of disparate thoughts with you. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about some formative ideas in, Mus in the Muslim tradition around economic transactions and economic thinking. But I also want to put that in conversation with the work of John Ruskin who was an English uh, art critic and thinker and a really phenomenal man with excellent ideas who was greatly discomforted by some of the changes that were taking place in the post-enlightenment. Post um, and then I wanna speak a little bit about the work of the organization that I work for. Of course, it wasn't started by me. It's been on for 20 years. And um, yeah, it, it kind of puts some things into context. So. There is no wealth but life. That is really a quote of John Ruskin's. Yeah. And why I have this here is because I want, to, I, want to, I want us to think about centering people, centering communities and ecosystems in our economic thinking. All right, so some things I, I would like to share here because uh, you know, some of the distinguishing factors of, of uh, traditional Muslim societies, one being that there was a serious decentralization of socioeconomic activity. So the state really was, the role of the state was very limited in that it was really only responsible for justice, the provision of justice, policing, and defense. So these three functions being the function of the state, everything else really fell into the hands of the civil society. So everything else, all the provisioning of education, of health, of, of nurturing, of markets, all of that fell into the hands of the people. And oftentimes that was very, um, was very rooted in local communities. So one, of, uh, one factor that made life like that possible also was the ability to really own and retain your land. And when I say ownership of land, I just don't mean the ability to buy it, but also the ability to have it without having to constantly pay taxes on it. So I could buy land and I could try to live off my land, but that would be very hard for me right now because I have to produce a fair amount of property tax every year in order to retain my land. And if I don't pay it, then I lose my land. So that was not a, that was not a, a, a problem in traditional Muslim societies. Once you have your land, and you, you can own it. And, and, and the path to ownership of land was really through, um, there's a quote, it's a prophetic quote, and it goes, whoever brings fallow land to life owns it. So the, the condition for owning land is really working it and bringing it to life. And once you have done that, it, it's yours, and it's yours for keeping. So the, another distinguishing characteristic was really the value for craftsmanship. So these were skilled societies. Work with the hand was really um, valued, and, and um, craftsmanship was, was a, an organizing factor in, in, communi in community life. So a lot of people who were potters would be in a small community of their own, and leather, you know, leather workers would be in a small community of their own. Uh, so it was an organizing factor, and all of these were connected to some order, some spiritual order, not unlike that of, I guess, Catholicism. But you know, we had spiritual orders in Sufism, Tariqas, and all of these different crafts. The guilds of craftsmen were connected to spiritual orders that organized their moral and spiritual universe as they engaged in their craft. So fine, we also had like zakat, which is, you know, most, some of us might know, but it's like a 2.5% of your annual savings, which has to be reinvested into, into the public uh, good. And endowments, uh, green zones, so basically this is prior to the enclosure of the commons. Uh, when the commons were enclosed, a lot of life options became no options anymore. So um, green zones ensured that a fair amount of commons were still retained for 
for people seeking their livelihood in their own ways and in their own terms. And uh, so essentially it was a, a free economy. It was based on brotherhood and it was based essentially on communal obligation. There is this, um, there is this distinction uh, in the Muslim tradition between Fard al-Ain and Fard al which is the personal obligation and the communal obligation. The personal obligation is for the realization of your own good as a human being, and the communal obligation is for the realization of the good of the community. And while there is a semantic demarcation between these two terms, there really there is an existential overlap. Because if something is good for the person, if it is truly good, it would have a ripple effect and it would eventually be good for the larger community. And vice versa, if something is really good for the community, it has to show some, it has to, ha it has to have its bearing on the, on the good, you know, in personal good as well. And finally, um, common good had to be rooted. It had to be based in a concrete local community in which one is nurtured, in which one works, and in which, in which one lives. So um, here, community and right livelihood are very inter closely interlinked. So when, previously, when I used to think about community, I used to think about touchy, feely love, you know, just really nice um, uh, social engagements. But no, that's not sufficient for a community. A community necessitates an internal economy. Because a community that is not based on an internal economy, that is dependent entirely on faceless outsiders, it has extra dependence on faceless outsiders, is not really a community. How do you generate local solidarity, solidarity without the mutual trust that is established through interpersonal interactions? How do we, how do we say that we're really a community if, our, if we don't, do not demonstrate that we are consciously intending to, to, to provide something good to our community, um, and we are consciously intending to invest in our community. And these investments are usually made through, life, through choices of um, employment, through career paths, through uh, livelihood and enterprise. So paths were, were technically are chosen. One, it, they have to be expressive of your personal creative aptitude. Two, they have to be communally relevant. So it's not just you go to your job, you come back home, and you know you meet some friends, and that's community. That's not enough for a community. What, the, what does your community need? What, what are the services that, that are, what, it, what, are what, what is really needed? What's really lacking in your community? That should be, or that was traditionally, a motivating factor for why people decided to be certain things, why people decided to be pastors, why people decided to be lawyers, why people decided to be whatever they decided to be. And also, they were it, it had to have some degree of spiritual fulfillment in them. Um, and also, another distinguishing factor was that economy and ecology were not at loggerheads with each other. They were really complementary sciences. So, in Greek, in the etymology of economy, is is the idea that it's the it's the house it's household management. It's the law of the household. And um, the city, the, the, that could be the household, could be the family, but it could also be the city, the state, or the earth. So really economics is the management, is the, was considered the law of the management of the city, the state, or the, of the earth. And ecology